I think the reader would find this uh, paper to be of considerable clinical use as to how to manage and control hyperkalemia. Uh, we think there is an unmet need with regards to strict definitions of the disorder, uh, frequency of measurement, and how best to manage patients that need to be on renin angiotensin system blockade but we try to offer some uh, guidelines, if you will, or at least some recommendations as to how can, uh, individuals can successfully use those types of uh, drugs. My name is Dr. Biff Palmer, and I'm the uh, corresponding author on an article entitled The Clinical Management of Hyperkalemia. This will be appearing in the March issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Uh, this paper, really grew out of a meeting that occurred with uh, 13 investigators that are well versed in the field of potassium homeostasis and clinical manifestations. Uh, the 13 people are authors on this paper. And the reason that we got together and decided to write this paper is that we felt that there was basically a, an unmet need in the approach to hyperkalemic subjects. And in the paper, we discuss and really highlight the idea that, for example, there's not a strict definition of hyperkalemia. That is, what is the value where you consider it to be abnormal? We also talked about uh, inconsistencies in the way that plasma potassium is measured. That is, whether it's measured in the serum or in the potassium. And then the bulk of the paper and bulk of the meeting, in fact, was a discussion of management of the disorder. And one of the things I think we try to emphasize both in the paper and it certainly came out in this meeting was that there needs to be a great deal of individualization. So as you read through this paper, you'll notice that we talk a little bit about normal potassium homeostasis, but then we get into the disorder in above itself. We subdivide hyperkalemia into acute hyperkalemia, again, defining that as an elevation in the uh, plasma potassium concentration in an individual that is not known to have prior values that are abnormal. Uh, we talk about the risk of acute hyperkalemia being really related not only to the severity of elevation, but particularly the rate at which it arises. And then we also kind of comment on some data that suggests that hyperkalemia, particularly in the acute setting, can rapidly deteriorate into clinical manifestations, even in the absence of uh, EKG changes. In other words, the electrocardiogram is really sometimes very insensitive as a warning as to somebody having an untoward event. We then focus a great deal of attention in the management or discussion of uh, hyperkalemia that is chronic in nature. And again, we define that as somebody who has an elevated plasma potassium concentration that requires maneuvers to uh, attempt to normalize it on a chronic basis. We mentioned that uh, in the absence of uh, chronic kidney disease, hyperkalemia is not common and that almost always occurs in the setting of somebody who has impaired kidney function or other comorbidities. But the exact frequency of the disorder is really not known because there's a great deal of inconsistency in how frequent plasma potassium is measured. As I mentioned earlier, there's differences as to whether it's measured in the serum or plasma. And then a lot of individuals fail to take into consideration the time of day that it's measured because there is known to be, for example, a circadian rhythm. In the paper and in the meeting, we talked a great deal about management. Uh, obviously, we emphasize the idea that one should review medication lists and avoid those medicines that might be interfering in the renin and angiotensin system. We also talked a little bit about uh, the role of diet in the management of hyperkalemia. And one of the things we try to emphasize in the paper is that we should not necessarily use a blanket recommendation to avoid all foods that are enriched in potassium, which happen to be fruits and vegetables, because that in essence withholds from individuals the therapeutic benefit that fruits and vegetables may have. Rather, one needs to be a little bit more nuanced. And just to give you an example of that, foods that tend to be high fiber, while there is a lot of potassium in those foods, the bioavailability of that potassium is a lot less as compared to fruits and vegetables that may be lower in fiber. That's just one example of being somewhat more nuanced. Once again, uh, good diuretic therapy is emphasized. 
And again, in individuals who may be prone to volume overload or who are hypertensive, again, that's a very uh, individualized good choice. And then we talk about the role of uh, hyperkalemia and its association with renin angiotensin system blockade. Once again, the failure to utilize those drugs or use suboptimal doses in patients who might be benefiting from those drugs creates a dilemma because of the fear of hyperkalemia. So we talk about uh, strategies that one may be able to utilize to help lower the plasma potassium and yet be able to implement these drugs that target the renin angiotensin system. And in that regard, we talk about the role of these new potassium binding drugs. I think as most people are aware, the only potassium binding drug we had for 50 years was sodium polystyrene sulfonate. But we now have data on two new potassium binding drugs. One's called pteromir, one's called zirconium cyclosilicate. Both of these agents have been found effective in controlling hyperkalemia and allowing optimal doses of renin angiotensin system drugs to be utilized. And uh, we highlight some differences between those two agents. One of the other things that we mentioned is the use of potassium binding drugs in dialysis patients. As you may know, there's uh, published data and now FDA uh, labeling uh, where one can use sodium zirconium cyclosilicate on non-dialysis days in that patient population to help control pre-dialysis hyperkalemia. So again, I invite the readership uh, to uh, uh, take a look at this article. And again, I think it would be of great clinical use. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.